Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Savor Food and Body. Today I'm talking with Tracy Brown. She is a fellow non-diet dietitian and we were going to be talking about somatic, somatic experiences and the nervous system today, which I'm so excited to share with all of you. And Tracy is, calls herself a somatic nutrition therapist. She is a registered licensed dietitian and a tuned eating coach in private practice, providing in-person phone and online counseling since 2006. And she believes in not wanting to be in the body as a way of protecting ourselves. So the work is more about nourishing the nervous system in order to feel safe, to drop in and feel a motions to actually heal. And I find this to be so important, especially when we're talking about like emotional coping with food and is someone an emotional eater or what's the good, the bad and the ugly of emotional eating. And I have done a, a number of courses and supervision with Tracy and just, it kind of blows my mind, the somatic experiencing in terms of how we relate to food. So particularly in midlife, when we have a lot going on, we have a lot of shiitake hitting the fan. I think becoming aware of our nervous systems is really important. So Tracy, thank you so much for being here today. Oh. And I'm really excited for our conversation. Amanda, thanks for having me. And I love that you jumped right in with that because it's not an un maybe felt sense con concept for people listening to this that like we might know what we need to do. Like eat from hunger and fullness, do our self-care. And then why is that so hard sometimes to do what we know that would be soothing or nurturing or nourishing or supportive to like our, our bodies, whether it's eating, sleep, whatever, is it sometimes the body maybe never has ever felt like a very safe container to be in. And that has nothing to do with intellect. It has more to do with, um, yeah, lack of perceived, like I said, safety and Part of the work is learning how to identify basically what's too much, what's not enough, what's food signals, biological signals, what's just unprocessed stuff, you mean emotion and sensation in this body container because sensations of our emotions in our bodies is not in our, in our brain. Our brain does the, the data collection and the processing, but the body holds the pain of emotions that don't, we don't know how to process, deal with that we've experienced, forgot about, whatever, so. Absolutely, and as you're saying that, I'm just reminded of how many times I'm having the conversations with clients around why intuitive eating is hard. Because so often I think we get the messaging that just like you said, like, well, you honor your hunger and your satisfaction and fullness and boom, there you go, you're on your way. And it's completely leaving out that part that your head might be on the way but your body isn't necessarily ready to follow along yet. And why is that? That's one of the biggest saboteurs, probably not on, not on a person's part of doing intuitive eating. And I tell my clients like the first session, second, if I forget is that, you know, once we start going, whether they're needing to re-nourish or we're doing some containment from some of the maybe emotional eating chaos a bit, I would say, no, nothing, nothing bad is happening by about week five or six you're going to feel like you want to run away and something's wrong here because maybe you're getting some clear or hunger fullness signals and some differentiation between like, um, when we say, I feel fat, what really say that I feel uncomfortable. You didn't really eat that much as much as you feel like you did, but it's just new to not do, I'll call it dieters full versus like really full and like over full. But what happens is all those emotions aren't being um, emotionally under overeaten to smush around, smush around, push down. And then you do kind of feel worse before you feel better. And that's, that's obviously a hard sell and the books and stuff don't talk about that that much because one, it's hard to articulate until you do it. And two, it's not super appealing to want to get started with that. But if we have the tools and we have the willingness to be a compassionate witness and unpack all that and, um, hang in there that will pass too. And you'll grow more capacity to, oh, that's an emotion. That's not the same thing as a threat inside. Absolutely. And one of the things that I've learned from you too, over time is, you know, we're, we're using this word emotions a lot, but that what we're really talking about too is trauma and the different types of trauma, big T, little T that someone has experienced throughout mm -hmm. their life, including 
the trauma of being hungry from being on diet after diet after diet. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit to around just in general, maybe those different types of trauma and how we experience them in the body. You've been, you mentioned, you know, what, what our body is feeling and we hang on to those emotions in our bodies. And so what might that look like? What have you experienced with your clients? Well, um, I think traditionally in our culture, uh, we think as if trauma is like war or, you know, going to war or being in it yourself or, um, shock trauma, like car accidents, um, obvious physical or sexual abuse. And that happens to people I know that Amanda, you and I work with, but the majority of time, the clients that we are, the people we're working with are people who maybe, you know, on paper, on the outside, things are relatively okay. I had a decent or good or maybe even relatively okay childhood. Um, you know, I had, I had maybe hopefully enough food, shelter, I got stuff, you know, I got gifts, whatever. And maybe I was encouraged to do well in some part of my life, but emotionally there was nothing, there was no neurobiology on board for emotions, feeling welcome. Or even if you had a need to express that, if it made somebody else feel um, uncomfortable or overwhelmed. So most of our clients, Amanda, we know they come from places where emotionally, most of their trauma comes from we'll call it developmental trauma, just not enough relative, safe enough um, attunement and witnessing. And that can come from adoption, that can come from just things that nobody could control, like um, uh, being in the NICU for a really long time, especially in the old days when babies weren't touched and held. You know, we see this in orphanages where it's just like we don't have that co-regulation of eye contact and warm emotional warmth and prosody and, and care uh we start to get pretty the neurobiology of creating emotional safety just isn't there so we have to learn how to cope with that missingness the best way we can which is for some people perfectionism and and chronic overthinking or checking out with all kinds of other things and eventually that can turn into eating issues once you hit this vortex sometimes of um noticing you have a body or your body being noticed or objectified or diet culture kicks in or you've been absorbing that for all your life it builds and builds and builds so you want to finally get some relief and what do people do they diet they purge exercise whatever it's like oh i feel better for like some relief for the first time in my life possibly mm -hmm. and sometimes you can get sucked in just like that and you don't go from um skipping breakfast or running when you're stressed and that's the only way you can run away from overwhelm that doesn't, that doesn't happen from zero overnight you have an eating disorder but it takes time you know uh, and especially if it's encouraged it goes faster but i will say about other kinds of trauma developmental trauma there's the obvious abuse even watching any kind of abuse of anybody else um you know and even traumas like birth birth trauma medical things i see that way more often than you know you're getting hit by a train, right? There's, so those are all the things that most people minimize that if you had to be the adult to the adults, that means you lost a lot of your childhood. You lost a lot of your own being able to care, get care to learn the, the appropriate developmental stages of, you know, being able to both be cared for and learn how to play and have an identity and have a self. Um, if you miss some of that, then it's, you're pretty, probably a pretty good caretaker your whole life, but you don't know who you are. So sometimes diet culture will tell you who you are. You're a really good person if you lose 10 pounds. <laughs> well, you're really much more lovable if you do that. So there's, diet culture really kind of fits in those attachment wounds um, insidiously very well for people. So yeah. I love that how you just said that and what, what you were saying, it made me think of, you know, when we're in, in high school and we're trying to find our place in the world and when someone feels like, or maybe I remember even kind of identifying when I was in high school, like some of the, the other students that they were kind of outsiders, they kind of didn't really fit in any one group for whatever silly adolescent reason we all made up, you know, but and so they would, they would glom on to a group then that would show them some acceptance. 
And isn't that interesting that diet culture kind of does that for the people that feel like they have no other form of attachment mm -hmm. and it gives them something to grasp onto okay. some rules to follow some acceptance. Oh, now they can talk within, you know, particularly with women. Now they can talk within a group of women of like, I'm eating this. I'm not eating this. I'm doing this program. Like there's some socialization that totally. happens around that too. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really interesting parallel there. And I hadn't really thought about yeah. that until you just mentioned that when someone has had this difficulty feeling attachment, feeling care, feeling support earlier in life, it could be even easier so to much grab easier. on to the safety of diet culture. And I think that it's a sobering thought of like, well, if there's millions of, of women trying to diet at any one time at all different kinds of ages, then that tells you, and we're going to talk about vulnerability markers in a second here, but it's like that tells you maybe how much people have something missing within this. How many more people than we believe like probably have some, some level of misattunements in their attachment system, not secure attachment, insecure, that makes them people so much more vulnerable. And then you add on top, just the, just the programming. I mean, it's a whole system, like create a problem that you don't have and market to people to think you have a problem. And then they create the solutions to the problem they created that you never had in the first place. So that's how that whole, Mm -hmm. diabolical system works anyway you know so it's very traumatizing in itself it makes you think that there's a threat and you didn't know you were in a threat situation by having a, the body you have so it's another trauma in itself yeah it's the marriage of the i'm looking for acceptance oh and the overall culture and society will accept me if i follow the rules of this group and become smaller and try to achieve that elusive and then, ideal and then never put down in the very fine print and by the way this is going to make you obsessive and hmm. um actually competitive and jealous of your your and um all the things all the things that it promises and, and surface level attachment and connection yeah. it's not the same thing as like i really know you and see you and feels more unconditional it's very conditional and that's right. never what you were wanting in the first place but maybe and, it's all that feels like you could, that's around the grasp. So. Right. And I think that's so important for people to understand kind of like this intertwining of yeah. trauma, even if it felt like it was fairly normal upbringing or young adulthood or whatever, but some of these little micro traumas and how they can kind of tie into culture. Because I think particularly for women in midlife, we're talking about decades yeah. of these micro traumas, just kind of building up, they building build, up, building build, up. Build. I love you said that. Cause like the research is really interesting with um, developmental trauma and anorexia. There's a little bit of that out there. And I think we could apply it to the other eating disorders and chronic dieting and body image issues as well. Is that they found that, that especially people who have that pre-verbal too much, not enough, like, you know, uh, just the wrong kind of care that was too much or not enough of, of anything or not enough good is that there's this imprint on the system like the, the you know nervous system you know brain that anytime you know, when you when there's unrequited you know I don't know if that's the right word but unprocessed grief and loss you can't get that early snuggles back and you don't have the neural pathways that the, you have the neural pathways to prove it you have you can grow into those things, but anytime there's like a loss or a transitional period, people are way more likely to struggle with food and weight because it's a care object and we're missing the care objects, right? So menopause or midlife is one of those because you're in a major life transition. And that's why you see so many people, the kids are gone or transition shift and I'm going through this and there's space and you want to immediately fill that space because those emotions will come up. And you're going to, what do most people do? You know, something drastic. You try to fix your body with the body changes, you know, that seem to kind of happen at the same time. So that's why this podcast is so valuable that you do, Amanda, because it's like you were primed to struggle with food and weight right now, unless we get on top of it. Because if you've got that history of any kind of uh, insecure attachment, loss of like, in, in, uh, it's called a internal locus to control. Like I know who I am and I know that like, Oh my, all these people that I hang out with, well, they're jumping off bridges. Well, I know that's bad for me, even though I really love these people and I want to hang out with them. I'm not going to do that. 
it takes that level of like, you know, I got to really know what's good for me, even if everybody else does something different. Mm -hmm. And that only comes from having a lot of secure attachment. Like, oh, I'm, my needs aren't made to feel like too much. I'm not gaslit. My big emotions are ignored. People listen to me. They care. You know, you got to have a neurobiology for that. And if you're missing that, when we go through different stages, whether it's puberty, leaving home, jobs, weddings, kids, funerals, midlife, those are just transitional um, open doors mm -hmm. that we've got to have something to hold on to. Otherwise, diet culture will kind of try to suck back in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and so, you know, in your work as a, a somatic nutrition and body image coach, and I know I've learned a bit of, pol of, of this you know, polyvagal theory with you yeah. and window intolerance, but I'm wondering if you can walk us through maybe that lens of okay. healing and yeah. how that can relate to our relationship with okay. body. So how do we get back to having some okay. kind of Okay, well, I'll try to do, the, uh, try to do like um, the shortest and clearest <laughs> of anatomy and physiology lesson really quick. I'll try. Um, so we all know we have a nervous system that like covers like everything inside under the, under the skin and in the organs. And there are two parts that work together. So we have our sympathetic nervous system and people probably know that is like the fight or flight part of our nervous system. Probably people know, heard those terms. So the sympathetic part of our nervous system mobilizes us into action and that's awesome. And it helps you know, our, it gets information from our five senses or our, our five far senses, which is our, you know, sight and sound and touch and smell and taste. And then our near senses, we also sense things from the inside. And that is our um, interception, hunger, fullness, got to go to the bathroom, feel a gas bubble, whatever, or a, a, a stitch in our side, whatever. Um, proprioception, like, oh, this chair's holding me up and I don't have to look at that. I can feel it. I can feel my body against something else with gravity and our, um, our sorry, my brain, proper, um, no, vestibular system that helps us with our balance and all that. And that's inside us. Okay. So our sympathetic nervous system is using all the sensory information and taking that to our brain. Are we safe to be here and connect or should we protect ourselves? Should I be mobilized or can I just like kind of stand down? I can have a little juice humming in the background to like listen to this audio this video but it's not scaring me so bad i have to run away you know what's happening right now your body's doing that for you and you don't have to think about it the other um they just again work together it's like dimmer switches it's not like on or off and we got the parasympathetic part of our nervous system which does our connection like man and i are connecting via um vocalization and hearing and you know, gesture and prosody and all that. And that's giving one part of our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the ventral vagal. And all that means is like the nerves from like a nerve in our, our big, big bundle of nerves in our brain down through our diaphragm it helps us connect and also regulates our heart rate and helps regulate the heart rate, breathing, facial muscles, voice, all that. So that helps us um, be in connection. It's called our con like our safety and connection system, you know, the nervous, of the, of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other part of our parasympathetic is called dorsal, dorsal vagal, and it innervates everything else, <laughs> basically from like diaphragm down. And it's not myelinated, but all that means is like, you can feel a whole bunch of stuff and you don't really know exactly when or how or where, but you can feel it. And when that all three of these are kind of synergistically working and you're feeling safe, to connect it's either you're in like ventral sympathetic where you're engaged listening to this but you're not stressed out about it and you're connecting or maybe it's when you're sitting on the couch watching a show with a partner or your dog and you're still connected but you're more at rest and that would be the rest and digest so that's like ventral more and dorsal more but not too much of either and you're just hanging out but you feel safe right so that's that's awesome. And that would be called like being in your window tolerance where you can just kind of cycle between those two up, up here and a little bit or down here and ebb and flow. And that how wide our window is of, of ventral tells us like how much resiliency we have, how much stress tolerance we have, how much we can eat intuitively and do a hard task at work. 
how we manage our emotions and don't forget to eat or don't eat and push down all the emotions all the, is as the only resource. But when we don't have that big robust window tolerance where normative eating happens, it's, it's kind of squeezed because of ad, adverse childhood events, other kind of trauma, like from yesterday or 20 years ago. What happens is if we don't have people, co-regulatory safe enough attachment figures basically in our lives that help us do and learn how to be deal with adversity, we tend to develop these other strategies. And those are called faux window strategies. Um, and those would be things like if it's more sympathetic feeling, you're gonna be kind of up and racy and buzzy, overthinking things. I think OCD lives there. I think orthorexia lives there. Overexercising lives there. Um, we can restrict binge and purge um, to shift that state in that place. Now, those are just a couple examples. Emotionally, we get flooded easily up there. Um, yeah, and you'll just feel the physical symptoms of like being braced, your GI system kind of will slow down a bit and you don't digest and go to the bathroom as easily or, you know, it's just off, right? Now, if you did some of those behaviors in your life, like I had all kinds of eating disorders in my teens and early 20s. And so between restricting and um, bodybuilding, healthy eating, over-exercising kind of stuff I was doing back then is all I was doing in living sympathetic. My mind managed everything. I had no connection. I had no, hardly any ventral. And the only way I knew how to like feel okay is if I, when I say, okay, I didn't feel happy. Nothing was resolved. I never felt good. Even if I made a body change or I managed to restrict that binging that day, all of those restricting and binging behaviors were from, well, some of it was from the, you know, the caloric deprivation. When more you restrict, the more you're gonna binge. But I also got some emotional yummies out of shifting my state from like always anxious restricting to trying to smush down the anxious binging. So they help both, but that's not tolerable forever. And so what happens is over the decades, if you stay in that kind of like, if you stay really high sympathetic, eventually your body's going to crash, which is, I think we start to see that in a lot of women, I would say 35 and up, who start to be like, I can't get a bed anymore. I can't move. I just can't keep it up. And that tells me that there's a poor, that poor person has been in a lot of high activation most of their life for some probably good reason. Um, and that's where you'll see people like, I don't feel depressed. I just feel like I can't, my brain's mushy and foggy and I'm exercise um, intolerant. Like I can't even get out the couch to go walk anymore even though I want to. Couldn't do if you asked me to. Um, and you probably, gee, I don't feel really good. And that would be a symptom of dorsal which is things just on a hibernation when I can't mobilize anymore. Didn't work. All that threat is still under the surface of that, but now I'm just so physically tired from all the mobilization I'm down here. And people might still, again, restrict, but it looks different in dorsal. Sometimes people don't eat enough. I'll look at the food journals and it's like, what happens? Like, I know you're in recovery, right? And like, what happened to breakfast and lunch here? And they're like, oh. Yeah, I got that. I got caught up in something. Oh yeah, and, and they, I had, I thought I needed to eat lunch because I felt kind of nauseous and I had a headache, so I ate because maybe that would help. I'm like, oh, no wonder I feel so terrible. I haven't eaten all day, and they've been kind of kind of numbed out, and uh, that that kind of restriction usually looks different. Or sometimes people endorse will go on diet plans because they'll see something on you know Facebook. They're scrolling because they're indoors, so they're scrolling and not really. The only thing that catches their eyes, some kind of thing that they used to do in the past to give them something to do or to feel different, which would be, I'm going to go along the, the most aggressive diet I can do because maybe that'll make me feel better. You know, it's, it gives them a little juice, but it's not real ventral. It's just different from hanging out and I can't feel anything mode anymore and I feel bad. Um, and people can binge sometimes to feel themselves. If you're numbed out long enough, you start to lose sense of time, reality kind of feel kind of hopeless. Well, I just might as well eat. So I'll feel something different. This kind of thing. So, so um, there's this uh, numbness and emptiness and heaviness at the same time that people might restrict and binge for. Mm -hmm. And those are all faux window strategies. And then when people come to you and I, Amanda, it's like they finally something, you know, we always 
leave it up to mystery here. Like, okay, what made you finally feel like this isn't working? And some people will just conscience or whatever that is that gets us going a different direction is we start to have to look, okay, first we need to be able to name the state and be a compassionate witness of what are you experiencing? When you were more present, what allowed that? When you just dropped out of your window or you shot up out of it and then you crashed back down again or whatever people's pat body patterns are, what happened before that? What was going on? What has been going on? The basically the body just took off because it's like, okay, there is no resource and there's no relief. So we're gonna do what we, we used to do is that. It's very patterned because um, states become traits after a while. And we have to do a lot of work to be able to kind of sometimes hour by hour for a while, not forever, but like where are we at? Because it always will make sense with the food. If you track your food and you're also looking at your nervous system, they, they always match. So. Anyway. One of the, yeah, one of, I'm, I'm so glad that you went into that level of detail too, because I think where it can get particularly messy in this, like you said, say 35 to 55 age group mm -hmm. is there are a lot of sensations going on in our bodies that feel very different. Or maybe a woman has really kind of regulated herself around her cycles and yeah. she's gotten used to like, okay, kind of the middle of the cycle, I feel this towards the end yeah. of my cycle or my PMS feels this and then perimenopause hits. Yeah. And it's like, what? This is a whole new world that starts to happen. Yeah. And I think that what I see is that there's is kind of a collision of these two things and that one, someone is starting to become a little bit more sensitive to some of these shifts and how That's they right. feel yeah. in their body but they don't necessarily have the tools or how to understand, like how to sit with that, how to be open to that change. Yeah. Then yeah. of course we're getting the messages around anti-aging and like, just fix your hormones, just balance your hormones, you know, all of that. And what really isn't talked about very much in this space is this whole nervous system perspective yeah. to what's going on physiologically too. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is what, kind of leaves women in the dark a bit because even if they go and explore some of the the medical therapies and the physiology side of things because there isn't a ton of research on yeah. this age group because literally we're a hot mess and we'd be hard to research during this time period of life but then that can kind of leave women feeling like well okay so what do I do and if we add in this nervous system perspective side of things then even if we do need to be more of that, the like, ride the waves of what you're experiencing in your body. At least we could still form some form of connection mm -hmm. and attachment and compassion and understanding like, Absolutely. okay, this is what this is. Yeah. Like, okay, I just need to take care of myself in this space mm -hmm. right now. It's not something to be fixed. I just need the support of how do I ride this out? That's it. That's it. And I think that first step is being that compassionate witness. But the barrier to that is most of us weren't taught that that's important or how to do it. And it makes sense if you're used to a certain thing for an amount of time and your resiliency level, your capacity has a lot to do with how you view change. You know, if you have trauma, viewing change is like, you're always on guard for that. Because if you have a history of like, when change happens, bad things happen to me, then there's a wiring here like oh I got a different kind of cycle now what did I do wrong the the, the hyper vigilant part of that brain that's changes a threat it's going to see any changes as a I did it wrong it's my fault this is happening to me you'll get all that negative thinking and so that's some of the work we've got to do is this is change but it's not a threat like I said earlier to build a new neural pathway of like you know recognizing what your triggers are well the idea of change makes me feel triggered or the idea of heightened body sensations is attached to something. We need to figure that out so we can like uncouple that. But yes, this is new and it's uncomfortable. We're not actually thrilled about it, but we know that's just part of being a, a, a grown up and riding the waves through that, just like we had to do in puberty and other times in life. And we've done this before, but not pleasant, but we're, we're willing. Okay. Um, and then what could, we, what, could this be opportunity to embrace as well? You know, look in different ways to reframe what's going on. Um, and yeah, providing more care so that when you have the discomfort, there's something here to meet it. 
versus like, I'm just hanging out here by myself with it. Like, what do I like grab onto to get some relief? And it may not be the right reach. So that's why we need some space to figure that out. And I thought that was funny. You mentioned like, they don't research us because we're a hot mess. I'm like, I think we're just fine. Thank you. I just think that uh, they don't have the guts to like, they don't have the resilience to the hang in there. I'm not, we're not, don't blame these awesome women bodies here. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When I think about the research and I've heard other providers talk about this too, kind of in that same context that you just mentioned, but when you think about the variability that's yeah. happening yeah. within perimenopause, I can see why researchers shy away from working with this population because it's hard to control. But to your point too, is you know many women can get into that space of like well I just need to figure this out I just need to control it like it's this yeah. it's this yeah. this tightening this controlling yeah. and and that in my experience it like just doesn't work for this well, period of life it leaves you more frustrated that's right well because it's like this is something that's actually not in your control and it's not your fault and it's not necessarily a problem it's just different and that's why back to my point though those of us who want to like understand what every little symptom is and, and control it and how many weeks and that's a symptom of something bigger anyway. Yeah, that's really well said. And so along these lines of, you know, we're understanding our nervous system and, and how that might apply to helping us respond to midlife stress, but what are some ideas or practices that you use in your wor work with, with women in this life that can help them understand their nervous system and maybe grow that window of tolerance? Like, where do you guys start in well, kind of helping? I think I just do some education like we just did. So there's a little like education about like the threat response system, you know, so fight, flight, freeze, or please. Um, there's other parts too, but I'm just going to simplify it and understanding like what your thoughts and emotions and food behaviors look like in these states for yourself. What does regulation look like? What do these other things look like? So you actually are kind of mapping out your, your, your experience, you know, how do you, um, so we do that. And then what else look, yeah. What are the regulation symptoms, not symptoms, but like your experience, all these are different experiences. And then when you're, if you're hyperactivated, what glimmers help you. So that's a Deb Dana, a Deb Dana term. Um, your glimmers are anything that help you just kind of like have something to hold on to that does you no harm. So if you find that you get really activated and what activates you, oh, I think I'm going to high flash. So like one recognize, well, maybe I am and maybe I am. Uh, I'm not, but what helps you with that? Well, cool thing on your neck. I mean, we don't have to make it too hard. It can just be something that you use your body as a resource for. So you remember, go back to your sensory system because your body uses your five senses and your three near senses as a way to think, I'm bringing this information in to, to process now brain, central nervous system, brain. And you have to help your body. Hey, we're not in threat right now. This is discomfort, not threat. So you can use your sensory system to help your body. Like, look right here, just discomfort. What is this? Can we be with it? And just over and over and over again. And it's really helpful and you're doing these things, like if you notice you feel kind of tired, but wired, like after lunch, before you pick up the kids, you can get clear, well, um, your older kids are something, or there's something going on, and it's like, ah, what's really triggering me? Oh, like the tornado of activity at three, 345, let's say. Okay, so what does your system need to know that like, even though it's a lot, you're gonna be okay, let's say. Because maybe all that activation makes you have a hot flash. And maybe you would have less hot flashes if you weren't as activated. Maybe we, fig we figure that over time. So it's like, what do I need? And how much time do I need it, let's say. So I had a woman one time, she needed a snack, you know, keep her blood sugar stable, that made her feel better. And she also would hang out her kiddos. Um, well, they sell these sensory swings you can hang from the ceiling. A lot of occupational therapists use for kids with autism, things like that. So they had one in their house. And I'm like, why don't you get in? kids get in their swing and have your snack just and how long do you think that would feel good to be in there or how long do you want to try and whatever that was 20 30 minutes and it's not that it still wasn't a lot to deal with but it was a less a lot and it just felt more in control the the busyness and it didn't trigger her system to feel like life was out of control which therefore didn't trigger her body into some 
kind of response from that threat, like a physical, like a symptom response versus like, this is just a busy Thursday afternoon. I'm not out of control. It's not those old times where like my life was out of control and nobody was there to help me. I was on my own. I can't do this. Why try? Why eat? Who cares? So that's it. I hope that's a good example of it. No, that's a great example. And I think just what you said, and you've said it a couple of times now too, is just identifying, taking that moment to pause and saying, okay, is, am I in a threat state? Is this threatening? Yeah. Yes, it's busy. Yes, it's distressing maybe, but is it threatening? Yeah. Am well, I still safe? Yeah. So we got to get down to the regulation piece first. So I have, I usually try to think about if you know, like, well, let's say we I've identified parts of your day that make normative eating harder or almost like you don't even have a neural pathway for normal eating at this meal this time of day or you just never done it so we have to figure out well, well where what's missing or what's too much first and can we regulate that to like get you closer to your window or in your window then can we empathy yeah it's really hard that makes sense that makes sense that it feels like blah 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 so name what it feels like that's actually not happening right now but differentiate it this is 2022 in this life circumstance that I'm actually the adult in, but it feels like 1989 when XYZ was happening and this is how I responded and this is what I did with it. I didn't eat or whatever, or I did eat or whatever. And so having some empathy and witnessing and, oh, that makes sense. Number three would be, yeah, what do I need? So problem solving is last. That's like the frontal lobe part. I want people to get into like um, let's help your brainstem and your amygdala and the lower these back these parts deep in and lower in your brain that like signal threat. Are you are we in the threat? No. Can we witness this? So Olympic system. Can we get some good emotion going to like kind of buffer some of the threat belief the old belief systems? And then we can cognitively like, well, what is what do you need on this day? And that's different from maybe Wednesday from Thursday. We're noticing that. Thursday needs more than Wednesday does. So what, how do we make space for that? And that's always the biggest issue for most people is you can't do any of this work if you don't make space in your life for it. Yeah, I think that's this is, so This true. is an intellectual journey. It's just not a, some, just tell, give somebody, give me a flipping diet plan and I can check off the boxes and like be disembodied and not have to deal with any of this. And it's like, it just doesn't work because this, Eating issues are a um, feel like the body and the food are part of the threat issue. You, we already know enough that like, well, we can't diet anymore to really get some peace. But that means you're going to have to feel some stuff inside, and that takes space to figure out in this moment how come peace isn't feeling that reachable. That's not because I don't know enough. Right. Oh, that's so true for so many of the people that we work with mm -hmm. and, and they come in and they're, they're expecting, I think, especially as coming to dietitians, they're expecting like, yeah. okay, great. I get a new list. Mm -hmm. I get a new list of check boxes. I got a really and, high, high, uh, many initials after your name person. You can make me even a better diet. I'm like, no, right. That's, the, we just, that's not what we do. <laughs> No, we start in on the conversations yeah. and sometimes I don't know if you've experienced this too, but you see this deer in the headlights, like, did I walk in the right office? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're going to ask me to talk about feelings. And like, I'm always saying, and I keep saying, I'm going to get a t-shirt made with this, like get out of your head and into your body mm -hmm. because into your body, this is the, this is where the work lives. Yeah. So go one more step peace. down, right? So you, you just did my three steps, but you did it backwards. Yeah. You have your head into your body, but if you can't be the reason people can't be in their bodies because their body feels like a threat. So there's another yeah. arrow down, like, okay, how can we be safe enough to be in these bodies? Yes. To connect what we know with it being, uh, there's room for it to land inside. Yes. No, that's, that's such a good point too. And, and often a missing piece too, or why it takes someone longer yeah. to, to right. get into their body until we recognize like, oh, well, this makes sense on why it hasn't been safe. Well, to that's why I started tra starting trauma in 2011, because that what was happening in my office, I've been a eating disorder clinician about five years before that. And then, you know, some people, there's a level of like people who have eating disorders, some people have a lot of developmental trauma, all kinds of other trauma, but you do the work and they're 
kind of on their way, year and a half, two years, and like kind of done. They're they're good. And then there's or even chronic dieting. And then some people will come in, do six months of pretty good work, even though it's it's like you can feel like there's something a little different. And like the bottom drops out, they just start constantly dissociating or constantly like getting in fight or flight in the office and and really having a hard time tolerating the lack of dieting anymore and, and getting certain things start get really real and all the trauma blows up. And so really what, you know, this is how I learned this from a person particular, like, okay, um, these are the people that get shipped off constantly to residential and they cycle and they cycle and they cycle. It's like, there's gotta be a better, this person won't be in her body, but it was just flat out. I, it's as far as I can go. Um, Cause she had so much un, un ever talked about process and process stuff. And it's like, she was done, that's it. And so I'm like, all right, so what are we missing here in this field? And I like, and at that time, even sort of field wasn't talking that much about trauma at all. And I'm like, well, who does that work? Oh, a trauma therapist. Okay. Well, what do they study? So somatic experiencing and sensory motor and just different stuff. Um, stuff that occupational therapists know a lot about too with the sensory system. So I would just like each year I'd pick somebody new to study from and just keep going until I can accumulate this information and make it doable for eating issues. But yeah, if you feel like something's missing in like your process, or your journey or recovery, consider that like, maybe I don't, it's something I don't know enough that my body doesn't feel safe enough for it to land or something blocking that. It's not, part of me is like not having it, even though I want to. Yeah. I think that's so, so important and fundamental to people like yeah. landing in a, in a healing space at some mm-hmm. point. So Tracy, where could people learn more about your work and learn more about this somatic oh, connection yeah. to nutrition? Sure. So um, tracybrownrd.com. And then I do live Facebook um, teachings, encouragements, all, kind, all kinds of topics, everything we talk about today, plus lots more um, on Facebook. And yeah, that's Monday and Wednesdays. I'm usually on live for if you want to ask questions or whatever, that's, I do that too. So, And are you, uh, is that Facebook under Tracy Brown or Tracy RD. Brown RD? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Well, we'll put links to that in the show notes. Cause that sounds like a really great pre- resource for people to start exploring. Oh, and if you're a lot so, watching yeah. and listening to this and you hate Facebook, then I'm on all those videos go on YouTube as well. And it's still Tracy Brown RD. So <laughs> Perfect. Great. Well, we'll make sure people can find all of that stuff. And I just really appreciate you taking the time, ex- you know, exposing people to this idea and this different viewpoint of looking at food and body. I think it is so important. And I, similar to your experience, like I just want to keep learning more because I see this is a big missing piece um, for sure. a lot of folks. So I really appreciate you sharing your experience. Oh, Amanda, thank you for having me and hope everybody has a, a great day. <laughs>